This is on assignment. This Hello everyone, thanks for joining us as we bring you the backstories from our reporters here at The Voice of America. I'm Alex Villarreal. And I'm Ron Siddiqui. Mass protests erupt again in Egypt. We'll talk to a correspondent in Cairo about what it's like to be on the ground. In Somalia, basketball bounces back. Our sports blogger Sunny Young gives us the inside scoop or poop. Here in the United States, a groundbreaking way to recycle. And learning American English with VOA's very own comedy series. We're going on assignment, and all you have to do is stay right there. We go first to Cairo, where supporters of ouster President Mohamed Morsi are vowing to reinstate him. The Islamist leader has been out of office for weeks after the Egyptian military removed him from power on July 3rd. The capital has since erupted in demonstrations by Morsi supporters and opponents with clashes often involving police turning deadly. Sharon Bain has been in Egypt covering the events for VOA along with producer Arash Arabasadi. I caught up with them recently to talk about their experiences. Let's first look at some of Sharon's reporting. I'm standing here outside the mosque, the Rabba al Dawiyah mosque, where all the members of the Muslim Brotherhood have gathered. They are angry that President Morsi has been ousted by the military, and they are saying that they will stay here and perform acts of civil disobedience until their leader has been restored to his post. On the other side of town, the protesters who are against Morsi and our entire square vowing to do the opposite. So Sharon, Arash, you both have been on the ground in Cairo. What can you tell us about what you've been seeing there that might be different from what everyone is seeing in mainstream media coverage? I think one of the things that struck us was the sort of the, like the business of revolution. When we were down in Tahrir Square, we saw people selling hats and t-shirts and flags and banners, and there were little carts selling food and drink. It was a real, I know what we had mentioned before, a real festive atmosphere during most of it with a lot of children, face painting. Face painting was a really popular thing. And I think that was the side that a lot of media actually didn't show, that there was a, a whole sort of little community going on at the same time. Clashes between the Brotherhood and the military, as well as those supporting Mr. Morsi's ouster, have left dozens dead and many more injured. Reconciliation is only possible if Mr. Morsi is reinstated as president, says senior Brotherhood member Abdel Rahman Elbar. <laughs> What is acceptable is that legitimacy is restored once again and the legitimately elected president returns and matters proceed once again according to the constitution and Egyptian law. In this case, it is possible to consider reconciliation and in this condition, it will be possible to move forward. And this is the logical solution to the crisis. Soldiers are still positioned around Cairo's most sensitive buildings. The military would be ready to return them to their barracks when security improves, says analyst and retired general Samah Seth Eliazal. It's their choice. It's a, the choice of Muslim Brotherhood now. If they want to join the new political forces in Egypt, or they want, even as, a, as an opposition group, no problem at all. Or they will stay carrying weapons, carrying Kalashnikovs, and killing people. Now, what about the, uh, the violence? Obviously, there have been a number of deaths as a result of clashes. Have you been witness to any of this violence, any of these clashes? And have you yourselves felt any sense of danger? No, I, I don't think we've had any real sense of danger. Tahrir Square got pretty busy um, on Sunday night. It was, it was really, it was packed. I mean, it was, if you could imagine, like, somebody just won a big game, a, a big uh, World Cup game or something like that. It was a, it was a very packed atmosphere. Um, no, but I, it, we haven't actually seen the violence. We've seen the follow-up to the violence. We've seen the next day. We've been to, uh, for example, the field hospital in Nasser City where, uh, where they brought their wounded. They, they brought their injured from the night before. But we, we haven't seen anything with our own eyes. And, you know, that's, I guess, kind of been frustrating. It's difficult to report on, on things when it's all really hearsay and, and after, after the fact. And so what we have done, actually, is we've, we've kept pretty close to each other and made sure that we don't lose contact with each other because there have been problems with journalists in the squares where they get separated and the women have been attacked. So we've been very careful to stay in touch with each other at all times, sort of um, make sure that the other person's okay, always keep an eye out for where everybody is. Tourist sector workers say the unrest on Egypt's streets and Morsi's Islamist rule almost destroyed the industry. Even upscale restaurant owners are suffering. 
The armada of multiple deck cruise boat on the Nile is practically empty. I wanted to ask both of you if you get a sense talking to, to these people who are just trying to man their businesses, you know, they're, they're vendors and, and they're out just trying to live their lives. Are you getting a sense of any kind of protest fatigue? Not everybody's protesting. I, I would say that if you are a protester and if, you, uh, if you've been out there for the past week or two, then no, you're probably not fatigued. You're probably uh, as energetic, as energized, if not more, than you were a week ago. But if you're a merchant on a side street in Egypt, uh, in Cairo, and, and the streets are shut down, and, and if the regular flow of foot or car traffic's not coming there, yeah, I would say you have some sort of fatigue because your business is suffering. Um, but yeah, from the people who are out there, it seems like they're happy as they can be because they're, they're, both sides are doing something that they really believe in. Right, and I, and I would agree with that. There's a very intense ideology that's, that's uh, sort of uh, at, at the bottom of all these protests, but yeah, when we've talked to merchants, they all they've said is we want law and order, we want peace, you know, we want our business to start back up again. All right, and our thanks to Sharon Bain and Arash Arabasadi in Cairo. Now, before the current turmoil in Egypt, tourism had been picking back up. In the first quarter of 2013, some 3 million tourists visited Egypt, a 15% rise from the same period last year. We're taking a break now, coming up. Sonny Young joins us to talk basketball, but in Somalia, you're watching On Assignment. In Somalia, after decades of war, basketball is being used as a peace-building tool in an area of Mogadishu that used to be off-limits to the sport. Until about two years ago, sports and other forms of entertainment were forbidden in the large sections of Somalia that were controlled by Al-Shabaab militants. But as the militants have been driven out, Somali boys and girls are getting a chance to learn the game. We are joined now by VOA's Sonny Young for more. Sonny, what does it mean for the country that basketball is now able to return in these areas? I think it's a huge step, Alex. Uh, as you mentioned, uh, they weren't able to play in these areas because of uh, conflict as well as uh, rules set by Al-Shabaab. But now uh, they're offering free daily clinics for boys and girls uh, in certain areas of Mogadishu. They're getting to learn the game and uh, stay away from possibly some uh, harmful activities. Uh, some of the organizers say uh, it's a healthy alternative for these Somali youth. They won't be tempted by uh, joining gangs or drug use, that type of thing. So I see it as a real positive step. Absolutely right. In a country that has seen so much strife, something like this is, is definitely a shift. So how have people been taking to it? Well, in fact, Alex, uh, I think overall, uh, they're very positive about it. Uh, one Somali player, Somali-American actually, Yahanya Osman, uh, he was born in Somalia. His parents fled the conflict there when he was only three months old. And he was educated here in the USA, played college basketball here in the USA. He has gone back to Somalia to teach the game. And he says uh, in his words that uh, we can't be afraid of the bullets and this is, is, this is great for the youth in the country. Yeah, and you mentioned that, the bullets. I mean, there are still attacks on a regular basis in Mogadishu, so it's still a very difficult place to be in, very dangerous. Now, I wanted to ask you also specifically about women and their participation in basketball, because I know that that was something that was a major issue under the Islamists. Uh, they were not allowed to play under the Islamists, Alex, and uh, the Somali organizers say, uh, yes, the, the Somali girls are allowed to shoot the ball and uh, practice with, with the boys. And uh, yeah, very positive that, that, that the women are being allowed. I know in uh, some Muslim cultures, it's frowned upon for women to play sports. Right, exactly. So it's definitely breaking free from restrictions that they were that they were under. Now, what about this Somali national team? I know there was this newly formed national team that debuted at a regional tournament earlier this year. How, how are they faring? They did pretty well. Uh, they, they won a couple games uh, in Dar es Salaam in Tanzania, and uh, they have a pretty good history of, of winning basketball. Uh, you know, we'll see. We'll see how the sport develops there. 
Uh, overall, in Africa, soccer is by far the most popular sport. Basketball is gaining in popularity, however. And probably will start gaining more now that all these areas <laughs> have opened up to it. Well, thank you so much, Sonny. Sonny Young, again, from the Sunny Side of Sports. We're so happy to have him on. Thank you, Alex. Well, we're going to take another break now on the other side. A new kind of recycling plant you'll have to see to believe. You're watching On Assignment. In the Midwestern U.S. state of Illinois, there's a new recycling initiative that its creator hopes will revolutionize biomass waste conversion. The company Chip Energy converts scrap wood into mulch, fuel, and other products. And it'll be doing all this in a facility that's made completely from recycled material. On assignments, Martin Seacrest talked with VOA's Kane Farba to find out how the whole idea got started. Let's take a look. It began uh, right after Hurricane Katrina. He was watching coverage of the disaster and looking at, especially during the flooding and all of the waste that's developed when uh, things are destroyed in the course of an event like that. He was looking at all of this wood waste, all of this biomass waste, and he asked himself, what's happening to all that waste? Where is it going? Well, it was going into landfills. It was going into dumps. And he, he was very aware that it didn't have to go there. It didn't have to do that. Outside rural Goodfield, Illinois, is a pile of wood that weighs 4.5 million kilograms. Some people call it garbage, not Paul Weaver. I look at this as oil barrels stacked one on top of the other. It's a pile of energy. For several years, companies with industrial waste, like wooden crates, have used Weaver to cart the materials away. Weaver converts the wood into mulch, fuel, and other products that he can sell. My customers presently pay me to take the material and convert it into a value-add product. If I'm successful, I'll end up paying them. He's a metal engineer by trade. Uh, you know, he does a lot of work with heavy industrial equipment. And so he began to develop this facility uh, using that experience to uh, efficiently and cost-effectively develop a center that could accept that biomass material. And as we understand it, it took him some time even to convince the local councils that this idea was viable, right? Yeah, well, first of all, there is no facility in place when this idea begins, essentially. What he starts doing is accepting wood or waste wood from large companies around him, like Caterpillar and so forth, and he just puts it onto this massive pile. So what these officials see over the course of months and years isn't a facility being constructed, but a major or, or large wood pile of garbage being accumulated. And so a lot of people question, what is he doing over there? Uh, it wasn't until the last couple of months he actually started to get these shipping containers in place where he's able to start construction of the facility that the idea starts to become more of a reality to people. And I think now a lot of people have certainly bought into the idea. Are, are, the, are the products coming out of this, is it, is it simply wood mulch that he's producing or, or does he have other uh, products in mind here? Uh, yeah, there's certainly other products. Um, I mean, first of all, there's actually wood that doesn't even have to be processed that can be recycled or, or simply sold back to companies that need, uh, you know, uh, thick wood, wood pieces, you know, not necessarily wood that's been damaged, but, you know, certain wood that comes off of crates or pallets is actually good just to be reused by selling it back to a company that, that needs that wood. But he also produces um, uh, wood pellets, combustible materials, things that wood could be used as fuel for, and a lot of it uh, is actually helping fuel other things. They could actually heat homes. You know, I thought that the facility he's building out of these shipping containers is fascinating. It looks a little bit like a Lego construction from the outside. What does it look like inside? Well, it might look like a Lego structure on the inside, too, because you have these bricks, essentially, these boxes, which stacked on top of each other, uh, form rooms. They form, uh, you know, uh, hallways and so forth. And what he's been able to do is construct staircases in between uh, that enable you to walk up and down. Uh, now, really, what you see in the pictures in the report that I filed is really probably maybe about one-tenth, I would say, to maybe one-eighth of, of what the overall large building will look like. It will look more like a regular standard structure that's uh, more box-like in shape. Uh, there will be, you know, a, a walls and silos on the outside and then a roof over top of everything once it's all constructed. Does Paul Weaver talk about exporting his idea both for this biomass recycling of wood and for making the facility to other countries and places? Is this something he can do? 
Yeah, it's, it's, it's very much something that he can do. Again, to, something to remember here, this is a project which he is funding by himself. Um, he's gotten some grant money, but it doesn't cover a lot of the expenses it creates or it costs to create this facility. What he is showing is that all you have to do is get these containers, assemble them in such a way in which they're safe and sound, and you can construct many things, not just a biomass recycling facility, but many things out of these structures. And all the material is there ready for you to use, and it's a lot uh, cheaper than using newer steel or concrete. And one of the advantages of the new recycling facility, it's reduced price tag, about $2 million, down from the $6 million a conventionally constructed building like it would have cost. Speaking of saving money, cost cutting is part of what drives the reality shows that are so popular on television. That popularity has fueled the rise of a special kind of mock reality show, the mockumentary, like The Office with characters who address the camera directly and narrate the action. Viewers Mandarin Service has applied the concept to create its own mockumentary series to teach English. Right, and the show, English Off the Mic, follows two young professionals as they explore American life. The good, the bad, and the awkward, inviting its Chinese viewers to learn key American phrases and laugh as they're doing it. I got a chance to stop by a recording of the series, and I went behind the scenes with the show's main writers and actors and its director. Check it out. I don't set this camera rolling. Oh my gosh, guys. I am a freaking genius. You yeah. totally have it on the market before me. Yes. <laughs> you can be more sarcastic. I'm going to have to quit. I know the timing isn't great, but you have to admit, when the opportunity knocks, you've got to answer. It doesn't knock. It sucks. Oh my gosh. <laughs> this show that you do, it's like sort of a, a mock reality show, right, for yeah. teaching English. What are you hoping to accomplish with this? We wanted to do a show that was more interesting to a Chinese audience. Chinese audiences love things like Friends. They love Prison Break. Exactly. They love Chinese mm -hmm. TV. They love American TV. So if we're really going to be effective in teaching real American English, then we figured that that needed to be our format. Yeah, we provide simple sentences you can learn mm -hmm. right. while you are having fun. And, and you have the captions right there so they can follow along yes. and they can see also the Mandarin translation of yeah, everything that you're saying. Right. And everything. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Where's my hug? Okay, now, just a minute, we have to greet the guest. Why? Why? Thank you for bringing her. Oh my Why? gosh. Why do you think in, in China there's such an interest in learning English and learning about U.S. culture? The market for learning English is 400 wow. million Chinese people in, uh, in China. And the thing is, in China, you need to study English to take entrance examination, like college entrance examination, things like that. So it's, there's definitely a market. Wait, uh, every Thanksgiving? What does he mean by every Thanksgiving? Oh my gosh, no, no. Yeah. <laughs> one time. How much of this is completely scripted and how much of it is improv? It's actually it's, basically mm, script. Yeah. And it's then scripted, yeah. um, it's all scripted and we'll, um, the previous day we'll go over it together. The whole team will sit down and go over the script, talk about emotions. And how we're gonna shoot it, where we're gonna shoot it, what props we have and what props we need. I was imagining just calling That's by fine. yourself. And who we need. To right, who your characters yeah, are, yeah. yeah, and do the, all the preparation, and then just going to shoot. Start shooting. Different yeah. takes. Whatever Spielberg says, though, you do. <laughs> Let me introduce you to Underpin. Patent pending. Oh, oh, no, wait, no, wait, no, wait, no, wait. There's got to be a lot of memorization involved. There then, is right? and there isn't. So we're not totally set on doing the script as is. Yeah. So if there's a, if we're saying it and there just feels like a better way to say it, we say it that way. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, as long as the meaning is conveyed. Right. I now, mean. we do have certain language points uh, that you've probably seen from the video that we put, put up on cards. Those we have to say word for word, obviously, because mm -hmm. we're teaching those. Hit the jackpot. I really hit the jackpot when I bought that antique vase for $50. It's actually worth well over half a million. We're the main hosts of yeah. the show, and then we invite a lot of extras to help us. Like mm -hmm. by invite, Kevin. we mean by you know voluntold. Or just like, Please forced. come here. Yeah, force. Like we don't like to use force. Like, like right. back here, yeah. yeah. <laughs> They're like, we have a lot to do. We're like, you're interns. Come with us. Yeah. Yeah. How do you pick most of your topics? 
Uh, it's actually we daily have, lives. We have yeah. brainstorm meetings. Yeah. Um, our boss, who's not here, and we all sit together and just talk about our daily life. What happened to you this mm -hmm. week? Mm -hmm. During the week, someone will say like, "Why don't you do a show about this?" And we're yeah. like, "We could do a show about that." Or just you know, ideas that we may have had while we were just sitting around. Like it would be really funny if Mike got himself into this situation. Oh. We'll see you later, Mike. See you guys later. Bye. It was good to meet you. Bye. From the Just Friends episode, mm -hmm. there was a misunderstanding was. On, on your part yep. based on cultural differences. So how much of that is part of what you're trying to teach? I would say 50-50, because uh, yeah, we were trying to um, feature American culture as well. Yeah. Like we do Thanksgiving episode That's and true. like football episode mm -hmm. just to feature American mm -hmm. and culture. And we want to show American life yeah, to Chinese as people. as well, yeah. yeah. So I think it's... About half. I guess it's true because we're not yeah, all just yeah. breaking out of prison right. or like yeah. having <laughs> awkward relationship triangles like on Friends. Right. So. No, 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 no. Alex, just try it. Sit on my seat and try to do the work. And okay. See how you feel. All right, I'll, I'll give it a try. Will you be my director? The next, the next must have tech Keep your pants on, Mike. I want you guys to be my first investors. I miss my life. <laughs> yeah, I'll give you the benefit. This is harder than I realized. <laughs> Hey, that looked like fun. How was it? Yeah, it was, it was great, actually. But you know what? After that experience, I realized that I kind of prefer my lines on a prompter. So, okay. Yeah, glad to be here. All right, well, next week, we've got details for you from our agriculture reporter on China's efforts to take over the United States' leading pork producer. We'll also have the incredible story of an American woman who underwent a face transplant. And don't forget, you can watch all of our episodes anytime on VOANews.com, Facebook, and YouTube. Thank you so much for watching. We'll see you next time. The situation is like this. I think On Assignment is an interesting project because it opens the door to the world about what's going on behind the scenes at VOA. Morning in the divided Syrian city of Aleppo. A note to all our fine VOA producers, we're going to find you. We're going to put you on the air. Well, there's two reasons. One is the Virginia Tech shooting was We try to coordinate as far in advance as we can, and we also try to follow the news cycle as much as we can. I'll do beta, you do one of the cameras. And I'll do my The thing to remember about a show like this is it's like making a wedding cake. And that means it's made in many layers. On wow. VOA, so it kind of comes full circle. I'm working on kind of a fun piece right now. It's um, one of our music programs. Well, Alex is getting ready to talk uh, to New York City and Margaret Bashir is our UN correspondent up there. Take another question again. The purpose of using three cameras, maybe four cameras on these, on these shows is simply because we want to take interviews, give them a, a different look and a different feel. Concerned that Russia and China may not support. I like video editing because it gives you a chance to be creative. You do whatever you're most comfortable with. Right now I'm building the rundown, so Martin has given me all the different segments we're producing. We're starting on camera three. Can I say Islamist extremist? General Musharraf visited VOA in January and talked about Pakistan's Okay, so all the pieces of the cake are basically baked. Now we just have to go down to the final video edit. Sunny side of sports. Just blog. Can you go back to the um, uh -huh. beginning. Okay. So I want to make sure we have the right. Vlad kind of fixes our mistakes let's in the say, edit suite. Yeah, let's. Uh, I do my best. <laughs> Wait a minute. <laughs> Not that bad. Come on. <laughs> Oh, that's on assignment. All of our talent. I documented that because I would not have believed any of them.